Hi, I'm Marsha Roscoe, leading the Breathing in Christ community since 2013. Breathing in Jesus, examining what's most important to live into our desire to love God, ourselves, and others deeper. Genesis 2-7 tells us that God's holy breath forms us. Are you ready to consciously connect to Christ one breath at a time? Are you ready to honor every aspect of your life, what you say, what you think and do, as sacred encounters with God and others? Breathing in Christ discovers the life God intends and is here to help you align your habits and your behaviors with God's love. Because after all, how we live is how we love. Again, this is Marsha Roscoe, and welcome to the Breathing in Christ community. Hello, Breathing in Christ community. I am so thankful to be back with you today, where we are talking about habits, how the choices that we make become our habits and our habits become our character. So to frame our podcast today, I'd like to take us into the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel. And if you know anything about this 12th chapter, it is a chapter that is filled with warnings and encouragements. And in the 12th chapter, specifically in the verses 22 to 34, we have this section that has been appropriately titled, Do Not Worry. And this is a conversation that Jesus is having with this his disciples telling them, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. And here comes something really, really important that I think gets lost on us. Jesus says, for life, life is more than food and the body more than clothing. So our food and clothing It's just a way that we experience the world, but the core of it is living life. And the core of it is honoring our body. And later on in that gospel, in verse 32, Jesus says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And sometimes we read this whole set of scripture, verses 22 to 34, with all of these extra words of what we should and shouldn't do. Um, But we have this promise that is deeply embedded in this scripture that God wants to give us the kingdom. And then this particular passage ends with, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We are coming out of hopefully a long pandemic season. And we know that stress and anxiety are really at, at a high right now. And as a matter of fact, I was doing some research and the American Psychological Association has an annual Stress in America survey, and they've been updating these surveys more frequently. And what they most recently reported is that 27% of Americans are so stressed out they cannot function. And we know this to be true since the pandemic, we've got increasing number of people working from home, And this creates this feeling like they're always on call. We live these hurried and overscheduled lives and they wreak havoc on our nervous systems. They they disrupt our body's healthy processes. It increases the chances of chronic anxiety and depression, weight gain, sleep issues, headaches, digestive problems, you name it. And certainly our ability to focus and concentrate. So when we think about what it means to do not worry, and that where our treasure is, our heart will be also. I think this really ties in well to how we make our way through life. What we value is what we orient our life around. So we live within this system of daily habits. These habits are small micro choices that we make each and every day. Every single decision that we make contributes to and creates the life that we are experiencing. And our body as a living organism strives to live within rhythms, rhythms with pulses, beats, respirations. Think about your breathing, your heartbeat. And when we live in alignment with our natural circadian rhythms, we are much more inclined 
to experience life that is thriving. Our habits and our experiences shape our cellular structure, literally, biologically. So that means that what we do today is an accumulation of prior choices. And we've all experienced this at one time or another. When we have disordered routines and chaos, it upsets the body. Things start to fall apart energetically and physically, and eventually chronic health conditions come in, such as sleep disorders, depression, seasonal affective disorder, obesity, diabetes, you name it. These are all directly linked to irregular circadian rhythms. And so conversely, when we live within a healthy biological clock that aligns with the ease of day and night and and it flows with rhythm, with um, divine grace, we have improved health, resilience, and wonderful emotional benefits. So what this really means is that we can pay attention to every thought, every bite, every action as micro choices that hold the potential for our lives. And I find it so unique that God has divinely engineered our physiology to already lean in towards creating our bodies on their own design, use unique intelligence, inherently oriented towards building immunity and strength. Our brain is working incredibly hard behind the scenes. Our brains know that we need this energy to survive So our brain is designed to conserve energy, save time and attention, which leads to habit automation. Our brains automate our behaviors and build habits every day. Consider your early morning routine and the order of things that you do between the time you turn that alarm off and you begin your day. The brain automates these behaviors to conserve energy so we don't have to consciously think about these things. So our habits are these acquired dispositions that have already become second nature. They are so automated into our character and are how we make our way through the day. But only a small percentage of what we do in any given day is through conscious, deliberate choice. The majority of our choices are just on autopilot. So this means that how we live, what we care about, and what we pursue we're really already hardwired under the radar of our awareness into our biological systems some time ago. So the rhythms, the routines, the system of habits and practices of the past six months or few years are what created what you experience today. And so in his book, Atomic Habits, number one New York Times bestselling habits researcher, James Clear, offers this framework for understanding how identity-based change is far more effective than outcome-based change. When we approach change on the outcome-based perspective, we're focusing on what we get, what we receive, what are the benefits. Identity-based change aligns with what we believe to be true or what we aspire to for what we hope to experience in life. And so he gives us the example of losing weight. An outcome-based approach might emphasize weight on the scale, what we weigh every day, and, and looks at the daily caloric intake. Alternatively, if we want to look at this from the identity-based approach, instead of focusing significantly on the scale and the weight, we look at it from the perspective of what are the experiences of someone who is healthy, So he also lifts up this idea that achieving a goal actually only offers a momentary change. Instead, we look at changing our entire system of small improvement processes or habits to achieve a desired different way of living and experiencing the world. And when we focus on the daily rhythms and habits that make up this container or the system of our lives, we're better able to make progress. And one of James Clear's most infamous quotes is, you do not rise to to the level of your goals. Instead, you fall to the level of your systems. So systems are the very routines and practices and day in and day out infrastructures that are the container of our lives. 
So identity-based choices will arise out of what we value most. What are our personal principles? And to what or with whom do we identify? And so he contends that the process of building habits is actually the process of becoming ourself. And this is a gradual evolution. So for example, when I choose whole foods over processed foods, I'm a healthier person choosing natural fuel over filler. As an aspiring writer, every page that I write contributes to my aspiring identity to be a published author. Every single micro action that we take modifies our identity and it contributes to or takes away from the type of person that we desire to be to become. And so habits are not some finish line to be to be crossed. Instead, they create the lifestyle that we experience. And any habit researcher will, t- will tell you that over time, our life always bends in the direction of our habits. And yet daily 1% improvements oriented towards identity-based habits supports aligning our hearts and our actions with who we want to become and ultimately who God wants us to become. And so behind our actions are a set of beliefs and assumptions that may not automatically align with our desired identity. Let's go back to scripture for just a moment. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, Jesus is showing us how to live what we believe. Are we fundamentally oriented towards the world with Christ-like loves, God's longings, God's desires? We are naturally oriented towards the capacity to create. And the invitation of grace that we have is to live what we believe is true about Jesus. And time is how we live. So it's important for us to look at how we spend our time. How does what we say we value show up in the ways that we take care of ourselves? How do our values reflect themselves in how we spend our time and our money? How do we arrange the spaces that we live and work in alignment with what we hope to experience in life? The saying also, I've been, I've been hearing this from multiple coaches and pod, various podcasts, so I don't know who, who to give this credit to, but the saying is, what got you here won't get you there. So if there is this gap or this discrepancy in where you want to be, it is the habits and the practices in between that help that growth curve, that help evolve to the place where we are called to go. And so again, this idea that our identity emerges out of our habits. And the more that we repeat a behavior, the more we reinforce the identity associated with that behavior. So every single time I take the time to sit down and write anything, that is taking one vote of action towards the identity of an aspiring writer that I choose to be. Every single piece of whole food that I put into my mouth is a vote in the area of receiving God's creation as fuel instead of filler. Every day, we have tons of opportunities to invest in healthy habits. We can choose to spend the next chunk of time in an effective way. It's a form of gravity that pulls you towards whatever the system is designed for. So perhaps the invitation today is to pay attention to the very system, the container that holds your life. What are the spaces that you live in and do they align with what you hope to experience each day? How do you want to feel each day with what you eat and how you think and who you interact with? What are the relationships or the patterns and the practices that perhaps a 1% change can start to have a compounding effect? I was reading recently a a book by Margaret Silf. She's an, an Ignatian retreat director and the book was called Inner Compass. And she invites us to move inward toward the center of ourselves. This is who we are before God, without protective masks. And when we operate out of who we are, whose we are, and that is what guides how we act in the world, who we are shapes 
our practices, our behaviors, that is a much better indicator of a Christ-like outcome of who we want to be in the world. Jesus is our fixed point, she reminds us in her book, Inner Compass. If Jesus is our fixed point, what does it look like for things to happen for us rather than to us? What if we don't have to today, but we get to? Our decisions and our choices are more than things that we just do. They have the potential to create a life of meaning and purpose. And here's the truth. They deeply reflect what we believe to be true. Our greatest gift is who we are, not what we do. And so how today are the movements of your heart, your mind, your hands, and your feet leading you to deeper life in Christ? I, it is my solemn prayer that each and every one of you find the sacred space that you need to, to pay attention to the inner compass of your heart, to find ways to worry just a little bit less, and to receive the kingdom of God, which is right here at hand right now. Until next time, keep breathing in Christ. Mm-hmm.